Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the stream. Welcome back to Apex Magazine's Snap Judgment live stream. We're so excited to be here today, and we're so excited to be bringing you all along with us for this ride. If you're new here or if you need a refresher, this is how the stream works. Our subscribers and Patreon patrons to Apex Magazine have submitted some first pages of some of their genre short stories or novels. Uh, these excerpts are only 250 words tops. Uh, and as we will go forward, I will be reading these submissions out loud for our panel of editors and judges. If at any point during the reading, an editor feels like they would stop reading, they're going to raise their hand. If all three hands go into the air, I will stop reading the entire submission and we'll talk about it from there. The judges critiques today are meant to help you hone your craft and learn new things about both your process and the processes of other writers and answer that age old question of what is a magazine editor really, really looking for. Obviously, this is this is also subjective, so our editors and our judges have their own opinions about things and we'll be sharing those today uh, during the discussion. We do receive a lot more story submissions than we could possibly read in the 90 minute stream that we have. So the entries have been randomized. They're not being read in chronological order or anything like that. Um, they've been completely shuffled around and we'll go in whatever order the fates have set for us today. So we do apologize in advance if we haven't gotten to your work and we apologize in advance if we do get to your work. Uh, cause this can be a little nerve wracking. We talk about it every time and it's very nerve wracking to have your work read even anonymously, um, in front of an audience and a panel of judges. So we thank all of you for submitting your pieces and we're very excited to share your words today. Now, please welcome me, Allie, the, the host of the stream. I started to do two sentences at once. We're off to a great start. Uh, my name is Allie Grauer. I am your host today. Uh, as usual, happy to be back with Apex Magazine to host the stream. Now, please join me in welcoming our panel of judges and editors. Leslie Connor is Apex Magazine's editor-in-chief and the author of the alternate history extreme horror novel, The Weight of Chains. Leslie, welcome. Hi, thank you. We also have Rebecca E. Treasure, managing editor and flash editor of Apex Magazine who is also a writer with short fiction in Galaxy's Edge, Air and Nothingness Press, and more. Welcome, Becky. Hi, Oz, and everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> it's Leslie's dog, I think. And also, our special guest for today, we're so excited to be working with her, Ray Wild, author of Merciless Waters and the upcoming collection, I Do Not Apologize for My Position on Men. Incredible title. Ray, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so excited. I've been excited about this for a very long time. We're so glad to hear it. It's such a fun thing. It, it is nerve wracking, like we said, but we're always really excited to come to it because some fascinating things can be observed here. Some really interesting lessons can be learned for all of us. Um, and I always come out out of it feeling like I'm a better reader as well as a better writer on my own work. So I, I love being a part of this and we're glad that you're here, Ray. All right. Are we ready, judges? I think we're going to jump right in. I think we're going to dive into it. Okay, here we go. Our first submission is a horror weird fiction novella excerpt, and the title is The Many Rooms of Warehouse 47. When I try to remember the night Bone died, it's like staring into the sun. Look at it straight on and my vision blurs. My head fills with unrelenting pressure. I need to look at it sideways. Fragmented moments like in one of Tulip's plastic viewfinders. Ka-chunk. And I'm next to Bone in bed. White pills on our tongues. Cha-chunk. I wake up to his urgent cough. The bed beside me cold as Tulip's cries pierce the thin walls. Cha-chunk. And a big man in a black DEA jacket carries her past our bedroom. I no longer hear Bone coughing. My muscles spasm from the Narcan flooding my system. The bedroom seethes with cops. No one looks me in the eyes. Cha-chunk. And I'm thrown into bright fluorescence. I'm being wheeled through the familiar hallway of Baptist Memorial. I can't hear Tulip. There are no distant coughs. Cha-chunk. And it's deathly quiet, except for the beep, beep, beep of the machines breathing for bone. He's paler than normal the black ink of his tattoos stark against his milky skin. His parents are here instead of in D.C. Why don't they have Tulip? Cha-chunk. 
and the room is empty except for a freshly made hospital bed. I have flooded my sweat-stained baby doll dress with tears, the bleached linoleum streaked with a river of mascara. The hall behind me is busy. No one speaks to me. No one brings me our daughter. No one comforts me. They all know it's my fault. Off to a start with no hands in the air for this first submission. I would love to start with Leslie. I have to remember to unmute myself since Oz yes. is no longer barking. Um, so I'm intrigued. I'm I'm intrigued. Uh, there isn't, other than the like horror of the reality of the situation, we aren't seeing the horror weird part of this yet, but it says it's a novella. So you have a little bit more space for that to kind of grow and build. Like you are very, very firmly putting us in this tragic situation. Um, I'm, I'm very, I would be very interested to see where this goes and to see how you incorporate horror and weird into this. Um, like we, because this could be horror with no speculative element. And like at this point, as a reader, if we didn't have the genres, that's where I would think it was going. Um, but it's okay since it's a novella, like you don't have to reveal all of your cards all at once right up front with that space. Um, the only thing that I noted with the reading itself, and this is this, and I know this is a personal thing, the ands after the kachunks, I would take those out and put a period after that kachunk, let it stand on its own, let it take up space, and then start the sentence like kachunk, I wake up to his urgent cough, kachunk, a big man in a black DEA jacket. Like give that kachunk the weight and the space that it deserves to take up because that and just kind of blurs it out a little bit. It takes away some of the impact that it could have. And I swear I never get notifications and I don't know how to make that sound go away. Um, but I'm I'm very intrigued. It I like these sorts of um, weird horror that had to deal with drug use and stuff, which is where this seems to be going because it gives you a place where you can get super weird in this expansive altered reality. Um, I do enjoy those types of stories. So I think that this seems like a very solid start. Awesome. Thank you, Leslie. Rebecca. Um, yeah, I love the language here. Um, I love seethes with cops. I love this idea of like staring into the sun. That's like something that is easily relatable. So it's easy to relate to this character fairly quickly. I love the the world building done from the Narcan flooding systems line. Like that gave you a lot of context very briefly. Um, and I really, really like that. Um, I was going to say that the paragraph that starts with the Kachunk, Kachunk and its deathly quiet started to feel a little bit like repetitive for me instead of intriguing. But I think that Leslie's suggestion would probably help with that because they would feel a little bit more like they stood on their own instead of kind of these run-on sentences with Kachunk and, but if they were separate, I think that that might help with that. Um, and yeah, I would definitely keep reading because I love the language and the voice here and would be really curious as to where it goes from here with such a strong opening. Awesome. Ray. Yeah, I I thought this writing was really strong. Um, right away from the title, I was very intrigued. Um, I'm going to disagree with you, Rebecca, on the the two things you mentioned was actually the two points that I felt pulled out of this excerpt, um, and it was the the staring into the sun metaphor. And I think I I understand where the author is going with this, but to me, it feels like it's not quite right. Um, the that remembering versus staring at something and having pain in your eyeballs it didn't quite it, it pulled me out for a second um and the same with the bedroom seething it just made me take a moment um but aside from that I thought it was really strong um writing really strong imagery I kind of liked that kachunk flashback style 
and the author did a really good job. Um, I think that's a risky thing to do because then you have to set scenes very vividly, very quickly when you're flipping through them like that. Um, and I think they did a really good job there. I would definitely keep reading. And this is totally a, a personal thing to me, um, but I would do so cautiously because I am 11 years in recovery. And this is obviously a, a heavily about drug use. Um, so that's something that can very easily slide left for me um, in reading. So obviously I don't know who this author is, um, but if they are not a person with this lived experience, I would gently recommend that they use a sensitivity reader. That's an awesome not, that, not that I flagged anything wrong here to be clear, but just generally speaking. That's a great point though. Absolutely. Yeah, that is a really good point. And as someone who doesn't have that experience, I wouldn't have thought of that. So I'm glad that you brought that up because I, it's not my experience. I wouldn't have thought it through. Awesome. It's a, it's a very distinct opening, certainly to a story. And I think Leslie's right that as a novella, there's probably more breathing room for the concepts to come through. Uh, but I also would be curious to see where it goes, but also read cautiously. Um, cause it's, it's, that's a, that's a very distinct way to get in there, uh, for speculative fiction for, for concepts. Okay. We'll move on to our next one, which is a science fiction short story. The title is the taxidermist at the end of the world. The taxidermist at the end of the world busied himself in his dusty studio, touching up an Atlantic bottlenose dolphin as the last evacuation ships took flight. He knew about the evacuation order, of course, everyone did, but he refused to abandon his specimens. He would commandeered a defunct museum of natural history in what was once the greatest city on Earth. Magnificent foam and fiberglass models of extinct creatures supplemented his own private collection. In the ruined hall of African mammals, where he'd proposed to Rebecca, stood an elephant herd, extinct now for two centuries, their tanned hides wrapped around steel armatures and plaster cast skulls. The lobby, where she'd told him she was pregnant, featured one of the last known horses, which he'd frozen, then lovingly skin-mounted. Inside the crumbling remains of birds of the world, where they'd taken Dixie, aged four, to see the king penguins, he'd installed a reproduction mount of a common rock dove, a once ubiquitous city bird that now existed only in plaster. How could he abandon all this? So the taxidermist, now approaching 70, ignored evacuation order after evacuation order. Ships loaded and left, never to return. Finally, a young evacuation liaison officer cracked open the museum door and confronted the taxidermist, who sat at his workbench, touching up the polyurethane sealant on the mounted dolphin's sleek gray skin through an acrid haze of unfiltered air. Go away, he grunted. So we had two hands go up. Raise hand went up first so let's hear from Ray yeah so the the very first line kind of popped me a little bit because it reminded me so much of the opening of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy right <laughs> um you know it, with end of the world and now we're talking about dolphins um and so I like flagged that. And then I was wondering if they were kind of trying to do that on purpose to do something with it, but then I didn't really see them do that. But then ultimately, and this may just be my opinion, the style of using, obviously listeners can't see this, but they separated a lot of these sentences um, using M dashes. Um, and it just, it, it wasn't flowing for me in, in a way that would make me want to keep reading. It, it felt a little choppy. Rebecca, who is name dropped in this submission. I know. It's always a Becky. So I, I like the idea here. I love museums and I love like the idea of living in one and wanting to stay in one forever. So the, the concept feels like it should hook me, but I think I feel a real distance from this character despite and I'm trying to I'm sitting here thinking trying to pin down why like we have all these detail, details about his family he proposed and she told him he was pregnant but I don't get any sense of the character here except that he does taxidermy and he has a family in a museum I don't know why he cares about these specimens so much and I'm not really sure what makes me care about them other than the fact that 
you know, we have like a like a general interest in preserving things from the past that have been lost, but like why specifically in this situation am I invested in this character and in this context? A lot of it felt really distant. Some of that's from the omniscient kind of perspective, which makes it really hard to to get readers grounded in your character. Um, and then it the re, when I raised my hand, it was like the 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 repetition of this taxidermist instead of a name or something more to give me something more from this character it was just taxidermist over and over and it just started to feel repetitive and I wasn't connecting to it Leslie okay so I didn't put up my hand but I probably would have shortly beyond this if a few things hadn't happened um Again, I immediately caught the same thing that Ray did with like feeling like the Hitchhiker's Guide. Like I was like, it is that on purpose? Um, because if it's not purposeful, then you probably need to rework it. And if it is purposeful, you need to make it clear that it is purposeful. Because otherwise you're going to have people calling like, wait a second. Um, and the second part it, that really got me, well, from an editor perspective, there's a voice in my head going, holy shit, I know nothing about taxidermy. I am going to be Googling a thousand things to make sure that we have all these little bits of information correct. Because if they're not correct, you're going to have somebody who who does know something about taxidermy that's going, well, actually, this isn't, you would never do this. Um, so just make sure you have those tiny details correct and don't be upset if you have an editor going to you going like hey the, this didn't make sense to me from a reader who doesn't have this background can you elaborate on that or can you explain to me why this is the way it is um the other thing is with um the m dashes and those little pieces of information like where he proposed to rebecca when she told him she was pregnant like where they'd taken dixie to see the penguins um, those are nice little information about the taxidermist, but I am questioning whether it has any relevance to the story. Oz is just going to be very vocal. I apologize. <laughs> um, so I would need to see pretty quickly, like, why is this important in the story you're telling here? Because the story seems to be about the fact that he's not wanting to leave. Like, he realizes everybody's leaving, the world is doomed, but he's not wanting to leave. Like, that feels like the story it is. The story it is. Um, so I'm just wondering why, if Rebecca's not an important part of the story, if Dixie doesn't come up again, I'm not sure why we're seeing it here. Um, so I would just question that because it it really at this point feels like it distracts from the world you're trying to firmly place your your reader in. And you, especially when it's a sci-fi story on a world that's very different than our own, you need to make sure that your reader is very comfortable in the world that you you want us to be in. And then you can maybe give us some of those background information if you have the space and room for it. Um, but you don't want to distract from the story you're actually telling by giving us other information that isn't going to affect the story anywhere else in it. Um, I would have read a little bit farther because it may be that that information is super important to this story. But if it didn't become apparent by page three or four, why? we're getting this little asides information, then I would, I would pass on the story. I also, oh, sorry. oh, sorry, go ahead, right? Go ahead. No, you go first. Okay. Well, I was, I was thinking something similar, Leslie, and kind of connecting back to what you were saying, Rebecca, about feeling um, disconnected from the taxidermist himself. Like, I, I wonder if, if the author, you know, if this is essential information about the family, um, if the author could rework it and give us a little more, I think that one paragraph feels really rushed, the ones with the dashes and giving us that background mm -hmm. information. And not just more, but specifics, right? So if I'm someone who's refusing to leave a world because of my memories, I would think that those memories are going to be 
very like specific, like not just that he proposed, that he proposed with the ring that he got in the quarter slot machine, you know what I mean? And, and it was too small for her finger, like these like delicate memories that really show care. And I think that would both like help us to connect with him more and give us a bit more of a sense of like, oh, okay, this is important. This is going to serve a purpose rather than this is just kind of in a side between dashes. Yeah, I was going to say something kind of connected to that as well, that all of what one of the notes that I made to myself was that this is all visual description. And I would think that as a taxidermist, there would be smells, there would be textures, there would be a tactile environment here. And so, you know, like Ray was saying, like where he proposed to Rebecca, if there was a sensory detail that made that moment come to life a little bit more, um, that might have made me lean forward instead of going, okay, well, what kind of proposal and not feeling any connection to that moment. And so, especially with a kind of distance voice like this, if there's a good reason for using that kind of voice, using some sensory details, if you're not immediately grounding the character or the reader in the character, if you can ground them in the world in a really strong way, you're still going to start reeling them in. And so look at, at, at some descriptions that maybe aren't just visual would be something maybe to think about in this situation. That's a really good point, Becky. Yeah. And I, I think that there's something so interesting about the concept, like you said, Ray, of, of someone refusing to leave because of memory and the idea that this person is a taxidermist. So this person has dedicated their life to preserving things that will last forever, knowing full well that things are ending and they're not going to last forever. What's the point? I'm interested in that. I want to know who this is. I want to know why they can't let go. And and I agree, Becky, that if, if we can't get into the character yet, that we should be getting into the the tactile uh, sensory experience of being alongside that person. Awesome. Interesting. Okay, we have another science fiction short story coming up next. Uh, the title of this one is All My Special Days. Conception, near Boyle Lake, Montana, July 23rd, 1952. When they first met, my mother almost killed my father. She blamed Kronos for that, materializing her in midair above the tree my father was sitting under. Luckily for him, a branch absorbed enough of her fall that she didn't break him. Unlucky for her, her head hit the branch. She came to in my father's retreat, a barely updated 19th century trapper's cabin overlooking the lake. No clue where or when she was. Kronos wasn't talking. He claims he was damaged, engrossed in self-repair. My mother says he was pouting deep in the time tunnel's control circuits. So her first question was, what year is it? My father, Dr. James O'Connor, major, U.S. Army, retired, was convinced she had brain damage. Her ability to swear a blue streak off a wrangler's hide while she tried to get the time tunnel functioning again without Kronos' self-diagnostics or a 22nd century lab did nothing to disconfirm his initial diagnosis. Not that he was much better himself. When she was tired of tinkering, she'd find him staring across the lake, lost in his memories of brothers, both literal and figurative, killed in the war, of mangled GIs in his auxiliary surgery tent, agonized screaming mixed with pleas for their mothers as he desperately tried to stabilize them for transport to a field hospital. The day after my, the, day after the night my parents first made love, Kronos decided to work again. Okay, so we had two hands come up for that one. Leslie, what do you think? You're muted. Um, what do I think? I feel like this story could use another really good edit to just work on the pacing. Um, it, it felt very clunky in places because there were places where, you know, Ali, you were kind of like needing to take a breath where there isn't one in the page. Um, and also, I don't know, there's part of me, time traveling stories are really going to be a hard sell for me just because I feel like we've seen it. Um, and, and I know that there's always, as soon as I say, I feel like I've seen it before, I'm done with that type of story. Somebody submits a story to the magazine and I'm like, but that one, 
Um, so I'm not saying like, don't ever write a time travel story. It's just, I kind of felt like this one in this portion we're getting, there doesn't feel like there's anything refreshing or really new that you're adding to the time time story, time travel story canon. Um, so that is why I raised my hand, just because I felt like it, it really needs like an extra edit just to kind of work through some of that clunky sentence structure to really decide, like, do some of these sentences need to be as long as they are? Because some of them are quite long. Or could they be broken up into multiple sentences to give the reader a moment? Um, and and I'm time travel is just going to be a hard sell for me anyways. One thing very specific that I wrote down um, just a specific edit that I would suggest, and that luckily for him, a branch absorbed enough of her fall that she didn't break him. I would put that second break before him in italics just to give it a little bit of oomph. Like it, I felt like it needed some oomph, but that's a very minor thing. <laughs> Ray, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I agree um, with what Leslie said about this needing another pass. Um, some of the phrasing really worked for me, but it felt to me like we were doing the same magic trick over and over again to diminishing effects. Um, like there were lots of moments of like a quick pithy statement that I, I think the intention is to have it be like a hard hit. Um, for example, like Kronos wasn't talking. Unluckily for her, her head hit the branch. Like we get lots of quick little like jabs, but they feel like they're happening too close together and without the buildup to earn another one. Um, and the other thing I noticed was there's a lot of repetition of like mothers, fathers, brothers, like all, all of these sort of relational names and none of it feels like it has enough time to breathe or stand on its own. Like it kind of feels clunky and, and sort of forced together and, and the effect is choppy where I feel like if each had a bit more room to breathe, a bit more variety in the sentence structure. So it's not these like quick jabs over and over and over again. Um, then when you do do a jab, it'll land a lot harder. Awesome. Rebecca. Yeah. I like a lot of the language here. The My mother says he was pounding deep in the time tunnels control circuits. I thought that was really cute and fun and started to get a strong sense of voice. I, I agree with Leslie and Ray that I think another pass would be helpful here. And it's tough starting a story with backstory because we it's there's just not a lot of tension in it because the things that are happening have already happened and so it, it's hard to build up the tension there and I wonder how much of this information the reader needs on this page like do we need to know that that dad was in the army do we need to know that that it was a 19th century trapper's cabin overlooking the lake like how much of this does the reader need right now some of it is is world building and and setting and that's you know necessary too but I feel like there's a little bit too much on this page and it's slowing the pacing down which is what Leslie was was seeing and and I think that tightening it and maybe trying to get to something happening um like the end of it Kronos decided to work again feels like the thing that's happening like that's that's the thing that happened and so maybe if we could get to that a little bit sooner or yeah th there's a little it's just a little bit slow and and chunky for me with a little bit too much going on without enough happening if that makes sense like there's too much on the page without enough forward momentum listening to what you're saying becky it made me realize that something that that was in the back of my head is whose story is this because the child is telling this story but this feels like it's the mother's story so if it's the mother's story why are you giving us the child telling the story um it would like if this is the story about the parents meeting and her getting pregnant with this child then the story might be better served from one of the parents perspectives because then it wouldn't feel like you're getting this through this lens if this is the child's story then why are you starting here that's a great point, Leslie. I was going to say, I think 
it's interesting to have a, a, a time travel story be told in chronological order. Um, the idea that this is a, it, I, as a reader, this feels like it, it hasn't decided whether it wants to be like a dossier of information, like a like a, a personnel file almost, or whether it's personalized, like the, the child who is conceived at this meeting is the one telling the story, like are, is, is he or she the one doing the notes on this dossier or was the dossier presented? Like, I feel like it could go either way, but if, it, if it's gonna be told by the person who's being conceived, then we should have more of that personality and we should have more of that flow. And if it's going to be a dossier about time travel told in chronological order, the way a personnel file would, then I, I would want to see more of that structure and more of like, these are the these are the details, this is how it went down, this is what happened, and then maybe notes from the person. I feel like it hasn't decided what what frame it wants to be in. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And I think that maybe have answering some of those questions might go a long way towards taking out some of the things that we're picking up saying, well, this isn't working and this isn't working. And it might just be that there's too many unanswered questions about what this story actually is um, to be able to properly get all of that together. Absolutely. Yeah. Our next submission is a horror slash humor short story. The title is Hug of the Werepug. I'm gouging a hasty dick and balls into the slats of a splintering park bench to obscure the heart I carved around my bestie Bo's initials when a wet nose presses against cold, cold against my calf. A miniature poodle's beady eyes glitter in the full moon as it tilts its head at me. Adorable, therefore gross. If Bo wasn't perpetually late meeting me on our way to Friday nights at the Rialto, they'd be here, poodle cradle cradled in air arms, half teasing with a dimpled smile. Sash, why you gotta hate on all the cute stuff everyone knows you secretly love? If only A knew. The fond exasperation in air drawl makes a cat's cradle out of my guts. Get lost, gremlin. I shove the abominable mutt away with a steel-toed boot. Bo could be here at any moment. Instead of fleeing, the creature drops to the ground and rolls over with a whine, flashing its soft belly. A tiny cotton ball tail hammers at the sidewalk. I flip my knife closed and shove it in a cargo pant pocket before dropping from the bench to squat on the ground. Go on, shoo! I wave both suntanned hands, hoping it'll scram. It flips to its feet before sidling close to rest a tiny, shaking paw on my knee, begging for affection. Okay. We had Ray and Becky put up their hands pretty much at the same time. Becky, start us off. It's tough to do an unlikable narrator, but I think this is doing okay with it. There's enough humor. There's enough sympathetic type things that that, that I can relate to that, that I'm willing to give it a chance. There were some things... Um, Allie stumbled a little bit on wet nose presses cold against my calf. Um, and then for me, a miniature poodle's eyes, beady eyes glitter in the full moon. Immediately, I was seeing like dog eyes coming out of the moon because of the structure of the sentence. So that made it hard for me to, to stay engrossed and try to get to know this character. Um, adorable, therefore gross. My hand was like almost elevated, but it suits the character. It just feels a little bit. I don't know, melodramatic, but I think that that's intentional. So that's why I didn't raise my hand. Um, I like that third full paragraph. If Bo wasn't perpetually late, I think that does a good job of building the relationship and the characters. Um, I raised my hand when the knife appeared in their hand of nowhere because there was no mention of the knife specifically before that. We have We have it in the first sentence because they're gouging, but we don't know with what. And then we have all of this description about the dog and Bo and and everything. And then they flipped the knife closed. And I was like, wait, what knife? Where did and I had to like revisit the the scene in my mind. And so I feel like again, this could use a pass for tightening, um, like and and making sure that everything kind of flows logically from one sentence to the next. 
um, because I like the voice here and I would probably honestly, you know, and slush, I, I always give more than just this first page, as I've said before. Um, but that's where I was like, oof, I, the, the knife, I think needed to be mentioned again somewhere so that the reader didn't forget that it was there. Absolutely. Ray. Yeah. So I think firstly, it, it's a really big swing to have your fifth word be dick and balls. Um, just, you know, to be clear. Uh, so I think, um, kind of similar to what you were saying, Becky, some reordering, I think would be helpful in this. Um, not to say that you can't use this kind of course language. I, I think I'm understanding that the author is wanting to let us know that this is sort of an unlikable narrator. Um, but I agree that the, the imagery didn't flow super clearly to me. And then there was a moment where I think we spent too much time sort of describing motion. Um, when we're talking about, I flip the, my knife closed and shove it in a cargo pant pocket before dropping from the bench to a squat on the ground, where it feels sort of like stage direction. Um, so I think my, my big picture on this one is to just kind of go back through it and imagine sort of like the reader's eye trying to follow these events and sort of in what sequence we should be describing them. Because I think the sequencing feels a little off to me here. That's a great point. Thinking about um, how much information we're putting into one zone and and how we want the reader to sort of follow that. That's a good point. Leslie, what do you think? Um, first of all, I didn't find the narrator unlikable. I liked them. The fact that they are carving a dick and balls over the heart, like that gives you a lot of insight into this character straight away. I did and see I your like, smile immediately. When that <laughs> I'm like, I see what you did there. I like it. Um, I think they're kind of adorable, like gross, adorable. But here's my thing is that I know that this is supposed to be horror humor and I would like to see more of that. Like, um, like I'm not sure as of this point right now, we have no idea what the story is about. Like none. There's, he's, there's a dog and it's not even a pug. And the title is Hug of a Wear Pug. It's a poodle, which was confusing to me because I was expecting a pug. Um, so I I just feel like, like if you're gonna give me horror humor, I want I want you to go all in, like jump in the deep end of horror humor and and make me know that's what it is. Because again, one of the things that hits me over and over and over again every time we do this is is like we know because you tell us what the genre is but if you didn't tell us would we know um and i think that that's really something you need to think about especially when you're submitting a story especially if you're submitting a story to markets that cater to very specific types of stories like you need to know like if you're saying if you're submitting something to Apex, we publish dark speculative fiction. If I'm on page two, three, and I'm not seeing anything dark or anything that's speculative fiction, then I, I have to question why am I reading this? So if this is horror humor, we're getting a little bit of humor. I mean, I think it's hysterical, but um, but is it like horror humor? Like, is it like Jeff Strand horror humor. Um, so that would be something that I would I, I would really look at. And also, like, you need to give us a taste of like what is what is this story? <laughs> like what's happening? Because we don't have any idea at this point what's happening. We're just waiting. Like literally, that's all we're doing. We're waiting for Bo. <laughs> and that's all that happens on this page. Um so I, I would I would try to like maybe get some of that going faster. Definitely. Yeah. There's a lot of information that we're all asking for. And I think we're only getting a couple of hits on that. Um, but yeah, it's I, I also just noticed that 
the miniature poodle, which is not the pug of the title, obviously. But then in the in the paragraph about Bo being late, it says that Bo has a poodle. So is this Bo's dog? And if so, the narrator would know the dog and not maybe maybe interact with it in a different way. Um, I don't know. I'm curious. Okay, that I I almost mentioned that. But I then after rereading it, I took it to mean that Bo immediately would have scooped up this strange poodle. Okay. That's what okay. I mean. But again, but again, I was like, oh wait, is this Bo's poodle? Mm-hmm. So so that was a part that I I had to go back and reread. And I was like, oh no, Bo's just the type of person who would pick who would. up a strange Got it. poodle. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah, I think that it makes me wonder really quickly if this Mm -hmm. story is starting in the right place Mm -hmm. or if we could start Mm -hmm. a little bit closer to an inciting incident and take all of this character information and weave it in after that or a little bit closer to that. Because maybe sometimes when I start a story, like I have to tell myself the setup to the inciting incident, but then I have to cut that page and a half because the reader doesn't actually need all that. Um, I just needed to get myself up to the inciting incident with the characters. And so, like, I you know, obviously without a second page, we don't know the, what's happening there. But if that feels like that that advice resonates, cut this to another document and then try to weave back in only what the reader absolutely needs to understand the story. That's good advice. Our next submission is another novella, uh, this one in the horror genre. And the title is, who art not in heaven. I never expected to actually find a miracle here. These days, miracle is just another word for the latest post-war dysfunction. A demon horn leaving sparks that ignite a dying campfire isn't a miracle. Starving dogs circling a buried water pipe isn't a miracle. Babies born with eyelids that don't open until 40 days later isn't a miracle. But a camp with over 200 people being fed fresh meat? That was harder to dismiss. I had two main explanations in mind, one definitely outweighing the other, but that smaller one, deflated in size but not in tenacity, was what truly sparked fire into my calves during the three-week walk across the Nevada blood desert to the Sequoia Forest. Celestial blood is too heavy to evaporate. If you drink from any oasis here, you'll be pissing red for weeks to come and the desert reeks like an aged cat cadaver at night. Okay, I was I thought maybe there were all three hands, but yes. Okay, excellent. Well, Leslie, you did go first. Muted. I keep muting because Oz has been so barky, and then I forget I'm muted. Um... This is this is a lot. I'll be honest, the title almost had me raise my hand just because it it, it feels pretentious. <laughs> like and I'm like, well, you better like you better serve that. And if you're serving that, I'm probably still gonna go not my type of story. Um so I would really, really, really just consider that title and be like, is that the best title? Because I mean, it definitely says something. Just make sure that's what you want it to be saying. And then I just, I felt like we're getting a lot of just descriptions of what just random things it feels like. And it got very weird. It's weird. So I'm like, it, it's just very heavy and it's clunky I think that the um nugget of the story like the core idea seems like it could be very interesting but I feel like you have a lot of baggage hanging on that's kind of weighing it down and you're making your reader really work to figure out what is happening because there's so many things that are not happening and that just feel extra and heavy so I would I, I would really suggest kind of going through editing, read your story aloud and where you stumble, that might be a, a, a place that you're going, okay, I need to streamline that sentence so that it's clearer. Because if your reader is having a hard time holding the idea of the sentence while they're reading it, and they have to keep going back 
and rereading to be like, okay, wait, so let me make sure I understand this front part. And then let me make sure you want them to be able to get through it and hold that whole idea in their head without feeling lost. And right now I just feel like the reader gets very lost in some of these sentences and, and has to really work really hard to find out what's happening. Yeah. Sentence structure for sure. Rebecca? Um, so I like the title, but my immediate thought was you'd better deliver on that title. And I need you to, 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 so then when I saw the word miracle, I was like, okay, I'm with you. Let's, let's do this. Um, post-war dysfunction though. I wasn't sure exactly what that meant. I'm not grounded enough to know what a dysfunction means. I love post-apocalyptic stories and that kind of feels like what this is. And so the rest of that first paragraph worked for me, like babies born with eyelids that don't open until 40 days later. I was like, Ooh, that's gross. Let's, let's get into that. Like that, that worked for me. But then we got into the second paragraph and this sentence, I had two main explanations in mind, one definitely outweighing the other, but that smaller one deflated in size, but not in tenacity was what truly sparked fire into my calves during the three. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like it was too much to hold in my head, like Leslie was saying. And I didn't know what was being said, right? It was taking a long time to say something that I think could have been said in a much tighter way. And it was trying to do world building at the same time, which I appreciate, but we want to make words do double and triple duty to do that, not have the sentence, you know, blowed out like that. Um, and then the sentence that immediately follows that is another very long sentence, which is where I raised my hand when I saw that, that it didn't, you know, counterbalance with a short punchy sentence to set off that very long wordy one the next one was another very long sentence and I was I was just kind of like it just wasn't working for me um and I scanned ahead and I just wanted to say there's some echoes in the language and at the very end it says that the the character isn't really listening and that's really risky because if the character's not interested in what's going on why should the reader be so I think that this could just use a pass or two for tightening, for making sure that, like in, in the last one, we talked about how maybe the story wasn't starting in the right place. I think this one is probably starting in the right place. But again, does the reader need all of this information right now? Or can we start a little bit slower and do a little bit more work on the world building to ground the reader before we start getting into these, these bigger concepts? Totally. Ray, what do you think? Sort of similar um, thoughts. I feel like sometimes stories have an issue where we're not getting enough detail. I think this one has details, but they feel like the wrong details. Um, like, so if we're thinking about like needing to paint a picture of what's happening here in my head, instead of these details being brush strokes to create a cohesive image, it feels like you just gave me three brush strokes from three different paintings in the opening. So I can't figure out what this world looks like because I feel like I'm just getting one random image, another random image. I don't understand how they tie together and I'm not seeing it in, in a way that flows the way like my eye would. Um, I will say, I think this sentence celestial blood is too heavy to evaporate if you drink from any oasis here you'll be pissing red for weeks to come and the desert reeks like an aged cadaver at night i think that's a killer sentence and to me that would be my opening sentence if i was this author um but yeah i, I agree with a lot of what um becky and leslie said i just think we we need to kind of focus in on what we're trying to show the reader and what purpose it's serving in this story because right now it just feels like i had these ideas that I like and I want to put them together but the order is not necessarily coming together for me as a reader I agree I love that sentence it's very evocative um and I think if it was in if it's going to stay in that place I agree with what you were saying Becky and Leslie about breaking it up um and making it smaller or punchier in in places to offset but I I think I don't think you're wrong right I think maybe opening with celestial blood with a title like who art not in heaven is is a cool move to make all right next is a short story uh also horror and slipstream are the genres listed here and the title is a horse with no name 
The horse with no name stood at the foot of my bed, its face split, blooming like a flower. Nails tapping against glass drew me from my nightmare. My cheek was numb, having rested it against the passenger side window. Peeling myself from the pain, I left behind a string of saliva. I looked up to see my mother waving at me. She wore her favorite blue-gray pantsuit from her secretary days, and she dyed her hair dark brown again. Time to go home, sweetie, I heard her voice coming muffled through the window. Then she pointed a long pink nail behind me. I turned to see the car keys sitting in the ignition, left there for music and air conditioning to work. Open the door, please. I leaned over to the driver's side door and pulled the nub to unlock the door. Thank you, I heard my mother shout through cupped hands, then watched her walk unsteadily in high heels around the hood of the car. And don't worry about what your teacher said. She's just a bitter old lady. If she talks to you like that again, I'll deal with it. Cigarette smoke rolled in like a rising tide when my mother opened the door. Almost to the end of the full thing. But hands went up. Becky. I know that sucks when all three hands go up. So sorry, writer who sent this in. Um, but for me, this is very much a prose issue. Um, having the character wake up from a dream in the second sentence or third sentence, that's because when, when readers come to stories, we're, we're coming to go into a world, right? And so we have a very small window to draw readers in and where they are open to lots of things. But if you draw them into one thing and then immediately pivot to something else, like, oh, just kidding, that throws them back out. And if you do it at the very beginning, we're not all the way in yet. And so it makes them harder. It makes it harder to get back in. I loved its face split blooming like a flower. I was like, yes, give me this weird, crazy world. Like go. And then nightmare. And I was like, oh, 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 okay. So I had to completely reset my grounding. Um, and then I was, you know, going with it, but where it's like, see my mother waving at me, heard her voice. I turned to see the car keys. Um, I heard my mother shout. That's putting us a step back from the events happening on the page. This is just a prose thing. And we're so that the, these things are being filtered through the character. And with this, with first person, we want to be like right behind the character's eyeballs. So my mother's waving at me from the target parking lot. Her voice comes muffled through the window and it makes it more immediate and make, and brings us closer to the character. Unless there's a very good reason that this is being filtered through the character, in which case we want to have that to be clear to the reader so that we understand why we're at this step back from the character. Um, yeah. I, I love slipstream horror, so I, I wanted to be all in on this, but it just didn't quite quite get there for me. Yeah, I immediately want to know what that nightmare is like, which is a weird thing for me to say. That's not usually my bag, but I wanna know. I wanna see that nightmare play out. Ray, what do you think? Um, so right with the title, I'm again having the same challenge I had with the other story with the dolphins, because I'm immediately thinking about the song, Riding Through the Desert on a Horse with No Name. Um, so I I think I might make a different choice about the title, because I, I think it's just distracting. Unless it's going to be woven in in some meaningful way later in the story, I would probably rethink that title. Um, I, I totally agree, Becky, with what you said, that like, opening on a dream is a really risky move and you sort of right away break the reader's trust because you lied to them right off the bat about what's going on and they now have to reorient in the story and it's a risk that can pay off but here particularly because this nightmare is only two sentences long I'm not even immersed in it right to even be pulled from it so now I just feel like I'm not sure why we had these two sentences at the beginning um, I also think there's some repeated words in here. Um, I, I'd recommend the author do another pass just to take a look at um, that kind of stuff because it does become a little bit distracting as the reader. Um, words like home and door are repeated multiple times. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, it just it didn't draw me in and, and I wanted it to. I, I think I also kind of like the image of like a horse with a, a split, uh, split face. Um, but I just didn't get enough here to keep me wanting to, to read. Leslie. 
Um, the, the immediate question that came to mind as soon as you started was the title is a horse with no name. And then the author chose to begin it with the horse with no name, which is such a small di difference, but does have a meaning like the horse indicates that you know which horse it is um where a could be any horse that has no name so i just mind it just immediately when you started i'm going well why is it the horse so obviously they know the horse like why like that immediately popped so just and it wouldn't have if the title wasn't a horse <laughs> So maybe try to decide, like, is that important? Because it could be, it could be important. Um, and if it's not important, you may want to like, if you don't decide to change the title, you may want to make them the same just so that you don't have that little, little ping going off in the reader's brain going, oh, okay. So now we're a specific course. Um, I do think, I agree with Becky, there are a lot of places where I'm going, this could be simplified so much. Um, the first place, like I heard her voice coming through the, mu coming muffled through the window. You could literally just say, mom said her voice muffled through the window. Um, and it would just make it less, like it feels like the story is so much like wrapped in layers and unless those layers have a reason i think i would try to trim some of them out um other than that i really again we're in horror we're in horror slipstream and you're setting us in a very very normal like you start on this very weird nightmare and then you're setting us in this weird this very normal scene where a mom's like just like oh yeah don't worry about your teacher blah 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 like listing like oh you're in the car you're sleeping normal things I hope that it tips into the horror weird slipstream very soon after this because if it not if it isn't then it just is kind of boring like get to it get to the horror get to the slipstream um, like, I don't need to know every detail or boring conversation that this mom's having with this kid. It may not even be a kid. That's another question, but, um, but yeah, I just, I feel like it could go through, you could figure, ground the story faster, like figure out where we are. Definitely. Yeah, totally agree. I am going to be thinking about a horse standing at the foot of the bed with its face blooming open like a flower. Ooh, that's nice. I don't even go here and that's nice. Um, so I'm interested in that. I think if, if the, we had more of that immediate weird that, that we might be more willing to kind of feel out the rest of it the way they seem to want us to. Our next submission is another horror short story. We're hitting all the notes today, I feel like. Uh, the title of this one is Mr. Lonely Hearts. Mr. Lonely Hearts broadcast at midnight from his little booth at the college station. 12 to 3, every night. For so many years, it seemed as if he had always done so. When he'd first begun in the 90s, or maybe it was the 80s, he had simply played his music. An eclectic mix, sure, but that was to be expected from a college station in the small hours. He would follow the replacements all by with side one of Coltrane's Love Supreme and follow that with Hank Williams' lovesick blues. Every 30 minutes or so, Mr. Lonely Hearts would come on, his voice soft and low, almost pleading, and list off the titles of the tracks he just played. He'd give a station identification and end with his trademark line, You're listening to Mr. Lonely Hearts, Midnight to the Witching Hour, coming at you from the farthest ends of the earth. The station was located on the jetty, the long spit of land that hemmed in the bay, where the Pacific grinds itself against the concrete pylons night and day, but we knew that wasn't what he meant. Mr. Lonely Hearts might be sitting in a lighted glass box. Okay, all three hands came up. Awesome. Becky, you went last this time. I saw you gesturing like you might be about to conjure something or raise your hand to vote. So could we hear from you first? I like this 
first paragraph a lot. It's got a very strong vibe to it. And if I knew where the story was coming from, I think that I would have stayed locked into it. But the whole time, even though I liked the language and I liked the voice and I liked this idea of this weird radio station, I was like, but whose story is this? Where is the story coming from? So I didn't, you know, I didn't have somebody to latch on to. Um, Mr. Lonely Hearts, yes, but it didn't quite feel like it was his story, even though it said where, uh, where I was like, oh, maybe it is from him. Uh, in the 90s, or maybe it was the 80s. I was like, okay, so this is his recollection. But then um, when we get to his voice, soft and low, almost pleading, and list off the titles, I'm like, okay, well, is it not his story? And then where it, where, when I did finally raise my hand was, because the station was re re located on the jetty, the long spit of land that hemmed into the bay, where the Pacific grinds itself against the concrete pylons lay at night, that says the same thing three times. And I think that it could have been said more simply with probably that third one is the one that I would personally go with, but like all three of them are, are fairly evocative, but I don't know. It just felt like I still didn't know what was going on and I was just getting setting now instead of character. And I still didn't know where the story was going. So um, like I said, I would always keep reading further than this, but for the sake of, of the, the show, I think that that's where I was like, I, it's just not coming together because I don't know what the story is about yet. I think you said my name. But you I were... did. I'm so sorry. Okay. I did it. I <laughs> yeah, did no, it, Leslie. No I kept myself on mute. I'm sorry. No, all good. Um, I found myself scanning ahead while you were reading, and that's not really a good sign for me because my brain was going like, okay, okay. Um, like I, I, I didn't connect to Mr. Lonely Hearts, and I wasn't understanding why this information that you're giving me about the history of this radio station matters, like why it should matter to me or why it matters to this story. Um, and I kind of gave it till the end of the first paragraph because I thought there was a chance that the author might be sort of lingering in dull details as like a style thing so that they could hit us with something really strange or absurd or striking like at the end of that paragraph. And then when it didn't come, I, I, it just it didn't it didn't hold my interest enough. Um, to to keep going with it, I don't think. And and then especially when we're the second paragraph is going on to describe the station now, and now I feel like you're setting me up for another paragraph of descriptions without telling me like why this is important or why I should care about it or what the emotional stakes are in this story. Um, so I I think the the big picture note I'd give here is we need some kind of emotional hook in this story. We can't just list details about a thing um without letting the reader know like why we should care about these details awesome yeah leslie so i agree with ray i started to kind of scan ahead i am and i can tell you exactly where i started to scan ahead was when you're starting to just list the songs that he's playing and then talking about like his voice coming through and he's giving the station identification and his trademark line but it's like his voice comes through he lists the titles of the tracks again and I'm going yes we you just listed the titles and then he's giving the station you're not giving any information to the readers that anyone who's ever listened to a college station would not be familiar with. And I think sometimes you need to trust your reader to know what you mean when you say he broadcast at a college stations from 12 to 3 a.m. Like that gives a lot of information right there. You don't have to explicitly write it all out because like anybody who has listened to a, a college station, not even between 12 and three, you know, you get some pretty eclectic music. It isn't the same thing that, you know, on the pop rock station. So I think in some ways you, you need to lean into the kind of collective knowledge of your reader's base and be like, okay, well, if I say it's a college station in the 12 to three spot, people will understand that this is a, an eclectic 
band of music. You don't need to list it out. So I think you could cut all of that. Honestly, if I were to give a suggestion, I would begin with his trademark line. You're listening to Mr. Lonely Hearts, Midnight to the Witching Hour, coming at you from the farthest ends of the earth. And then I might add in, like into that tagline, that that his tagline, the station to let people know, oh, this is a college radio station, rather than writing it all out explicitly. And then get to the story, because as of right now, like you're hinting that the station is in this very specific location, right? On the jetty. But you're saying that he's broadcasting from those thin places. Well, get us there. Get get us to those thin places um, and, and trust your reader to come with you. Because I think the putting a little bit of trust in your reader would go a long way in this opening. I'm really interested to see where the horror comes in. Um, like we were kind of talking about, um, there's definitely a vibe that's being cultivated, but I'm curious like whose story it really is and, and why. I think it's Mr. Lonely Hearts and I think he's stuck in that station and he can't get out and it has been forever. Mm. Though I have to say, somebody who was born in the early 80s when you're like, he's been doing it for so long, the 90s, maybe the 80s. I'm like, oh, man, come on. <laughs> just Personal just attack. grind in the fact that I'm getting old. <laughs> uh, but, you know, like, if that's the story, if he's, like, secretly pleading, like, maybe these um, songs are really like a coded message and he's looking for someone to come and and save him from this weird time pocket that he's got locked in that I want to read and then it would make sense to have titles um but if they're just a list of titles which is what it feels like here uh then it's not you know, give me a yeah. puzzle. There's definitely, definitely some options there. Our next submission is a science fiction short story. The title is The Real Claudius Maxwell. At night, with the right angle, Samara could almost convince herself that the presence walking with her was actually Claudius Maxwell. The silent drone poured down structured light to sculpt a perfect image of Claudius from his many uploads. His gray eyes, knife-sharp cheeks, and curly black hair, which bounced as it would with his own actual walk, looked real, looked correct, but not enough for her. I see you tomorrow. You're seeing me right now, Samara, Claudius's presence replied. Delight radiated in her stomach when he said her name. His voice was perfect, as it was in all of his videos. You know, the real you. They wandered through the street, through the crowds along the Chicago River where some art exhibit had set up across closed streets. A moving life hologram of lovers embraced over and over on one corner, while whole crowds of ethereal protesters from the summer before marched along an empty street. Even in between the skyscrapers, thousands of micro-drones soared above the whole area, forming a 3D ocean wave, slowly shifting from reds to purples to blues as the wave crested and fell. Samara didn't know the name of the event. She only came here for Claudius's show. But she wanted to do something other than pace around her hotel room. In the crowd, there were other people with presences. Two Mark McLaughlins cracked on about the latest sim game in their Irish accent. Six Ellen Schmitz, a fashion blogger, went on about her new beauty products or fads she hated. So we had one hand go up this time from Ray. Let's start off with Ray. So I'll first say, take my thoughts here with a bit of a grain of salt because I'm not really a science fiction reader. So that could very much come into play. Um, but to me, I, I the opening description of this presence, gray eyes, knife sharp cheeks and curly black hair. Um, it just felt sort of generic. Like a, a lot of the details felt a little too generic and, and not lived in to me. 
Um, and I guess the idea of like a holographic presence for me personally, isn't enough to hold my attention, um, which is why you saw my hand come up. But again, that could be because I'm not a huge fan of, of straight science fiction genre. Um, but I, my recommendation for this author would be to maybe make some of these opening details more unique because then later in this snippet, we do get what feels to me like more grounded details of the world. Um, but those opening couple of shorter paragraphs, I think they could hit a little harder if they were um, things that we haven't seen before, like the gray eyes and knife sharp cheeks feels like stuff I've seen a lot. Leslie? So I, I, I feel like I'm doing a little, a lot of inferring here. Um, based on what is happening towards the end of this, like there's two Mark McLaughlin's and uh, six Ellen Schmidt's. I, I am getting the insight that um, Claudius Maxwell is some sort of famous person. And in this world, you can buy holograms like AI um, of famous people to interact with. That is an, an, an intriguing concept um, to kind of like think that you live in a world where you could interact with a movie star's holographic image as if you're interacting with a person. Like that's a very intriguing concept. I think that I would put in that first sentence where it's like, was actually Claudius Maxwell, like, give us a comma and tell us like that he's a famous person because I thought it was a friend. Like we're going through and I thought, oh, well, they have like a way to communicate with their friend when they're not like together, um, kind of like video messaging almost. But then it was like, it wasn't until much farther down that I was like, oh, wait, no, she doesn't actually know Claudius Maxwell. They're a, they're a famous person that they're going to see perform. So, okay, so now I want to know, well, what is Claudius Maxwell? Like, are, is he a singer? Is he some sort of, you know, vlogger who has gotten big enough that he has a show that travels? Like, I, I feel like that's information that... Um, would be better and if it was clear at the beginning just because I was confused it took me there was definitely this moment where I'm going wait wait a second like why are all of these drones falling around why do people have simulations and then it clicked I was like oh people are buying holograms of their favorite actors or their favorite musicians um so I just kind of feel like if you had put like one little line at that top like in that first sentence a little comma just to give us some sort of indication that this isn't somebody that she knows personally so you don't have that like disconnect where your reader's like trying to catch up um and it doesn't have to be you don't have to give us his entire biography but literally a comma and like you know rock star or whatever so whatever he is um, would go a long way towards it kind of being clear that this isn't a personal relationship because that's kind of what I thought it was at first is that it was a personal relationship, not a relationship between a fan who has never actually met Claudius Maxwell. That's a great point. And I also think that uh, as the as as the narrator in this instance reading it, um, I got confused between the inclusion of these presences and the like drone projection art exhibit and then also the concept of she's going to see his show so mm -hmm. i i would have liked some more clarity or or maybe we spread these things out so that it's not as i mean cluttered for lack of a better word i feel like sometimes sci-fi can feel very cluttered in the first pages if if you're trying to um give us all of this information but Having other people walking around the crowd with presences would have been enough for me uh, without the the projection uh, art exhibit across the street that she's not even at. Like, so I, I think, yeah, I would have liked some more visual clarity on that. Well, she's not even just not at it. She doesn't know what it is. Exactly. Yeah. 
So if she yeah. doesn't know what it is, like, why is it is it important for the reader? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Becky, what do you think? So I, this is an example of why it's it's tough because this stuff is so subjective. I was fairly grounded in that 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 Claudius was a, a famous person that she was had, had some kind of mimic of um, from the line from his many uploads. Um, I didn't know what kind of famous person, but I was able, like, I inferred that from that line. I do think that giving us a little bit more context as to what kind, especially since later, we get that Mark McLaughlin is a sim game player and Ellen Schmidt is a fashion blogger, but we still don't know who Claudius Maxwell is, right? So so having that, Le Leslie, your lips are moving. Well, it's it's funny where you say uploads because I was thinking, like, this is, like, a message system like you oh. would you know what I'm seeing like I thought yeah, it was yeah. a personal so my brain was like uploads well he's uploading information to her that then the sim can give her right so um yeah so just saying was actually Claudius Maxwell the rock star would clear all of that confusion up very very quickly what is lacking and I didn't raise my hand but I was kind of like making faces at it the whole time because again for me I don't know where to hang my hat I don't know it says but not enough for her what isn't enough for her what does she want does she is she like a crazy stalker um this is science fiction so like what does she want out of this relationship with this presence um and then that continues I don't know what she's feeling it says delight radiated in her stomach why is this a romantic fascination? Is this a professional interest? I don't have enough context in her emotional connection to what's going on for me to then latch on and be like, yeah, let's get married to Claudius Maxwell or whatever it may be, right? I don't know what she wants. Um, and then that big paragraph describing the crowds along the Chicago River, there was a lot of in-world kind of concepts and terms there that layered on top of each other. And I'm not sure how important they are since he didn't know the name of the event. Um, and so I wonder, like Leslie said, I think it was Leslie, why are we spending so much time on this when what we care about is Claudius? And if it's not Claudius we care about, why why not? <laughs> you know, like I need more emotional connection to to the things happening on the page, I think for me. Yeah, I, I just want to chime in that I missed that this Claudius was supposed to be like not someone in her real life entirely, which I think just underlines what you're both saying about clarifying that early on. Um, and I think that's so much more interesting to me as a reader to understand, is this some kind of obsessive parasocial relationship? Like who is our main character and what is her goal here? So absolutely clarifying that. And then I would even expand upon that because that's a massive opportunity to really deepen the characterization of this person of like, what was her motivation for getting this presence? Um, the other quick thing I just wanted to mention is again, that the emotional stakes I think can be clarified. So right in the opening paragraph, it says he doesn't look correct enough for her, but then right away she's saying his voice is perfect. So to me, like that's confusing. I feel like it, we need to rest on one or the other, but I do think that if, you know, Claudius is a famous person, that's a really interesting main character now, if they are like an obsessive fan and let's have her hyper focus on this presence of him and like, you know, noticing all those details and what's right and what's not right. Which to take it a, a step further, if she's hyper focused, you can get rid of like the paragraph with the art exhibit because her focus wouldn't be on that. Right. Like, I do feel like you need to mention that there's other presences and that there are other people, not Claudius, because that helps really dial in on what this um, situation is, what a presence is, which, which Ray and I both thought it was a personal relationship. So we definitely need that information. Um, but I think that you could get rid of that art exhibit part. Like, I, I think you're trying to give us too much of the world. And if your main character is super dialed in on Claudius Maxwell, then then keep your focus dialed in as well. Yeah, I definitely want to know more about 
like you said, right, what's what's her deal? Why is she we know that she's traveled to be here because she has a hotel room, but like I want to I want to know what kind of show it is, but I certainly want to know more about the presence thing because there's a, there's a whole conversation right now about AI and Hollywood and how people actors and performers and, and voice voiceover artists are all uh, very concerned about that as we all are in the arts lately. Um, but uh, but it's 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 a scary thing to bring into a sci-fi situation and I like my sci-fi a little scary like that. So I kind of want to know more about the presences. Like how much did it cost her to buy or rent this presence? Did she build it herself? Like I, what's what's the deal with that? And and also like structurally, I thought two Mark McLaughlins were were talking to each other about the latest sim game and that six Ellen Schmitz were talking over each other, like in a cluster, like hens, <laughs> uh, like chickens, um, which is very funny. But I, if, if the implication is that those are very popular presences to buy or rent, I would like to see them throughout the crowd doing other things and kind of set the tone um, visually as a reader. I'd like to see what's happening around them as well. Unless they only say certain things, but we already know that they don't because Claudius already responded to her he said her name yeah and, and, yeah and responded to like i'm gonna see you tomorrow and he's like you're seeing me now so yeah. obviously they have conversations outside of like pre-recorded information so why would like if you have two of the same actor or whatever the sim guy mm -hmm. why would they be speaking about the exact same thing at the exact same time interesting interesting Lots of questions, which is how sci-fi should be. I was going to say, that's how sci-fi works. That's how like... sci-fi is, yeah. yeah. But yeah, okay, cool. Awesome. Uh, we have another sci-fi short story coming up here. The title is How Many Luminaries to Boil the Frog? At an inconspicuous table in the Proctor Tavern, I smacked my lips as I masticated a hunk of sirloin. Flesh consumption, what a marvelous thing. My processor tagged the remarkable experience for further review. Often, when I refuel my meat cloak in public, other diners turn to watch. Tonight was no different. I smiled and gave them a friendly wave of my silverware, and a few bits of the beef dribbled down my chin. Their heads jerked back to their plates without returning my greeting. Chew with your mouth closed, Robert, urged my, Colleen, uh, urged my colleague Irene. She attuned her behavior much closer to our target species' mannerisms and social cues, infiltrators needed to. Sorry, I said, trying and failing to follow her advice. Finally, I swallowed and asked, when the time comes, will Einstein do it? He's a pacifist, but I think so, especially if what's happening in Germany gets as bad as you say it will. The San Gabriel Valley provided our base of operations thanks to Caltech and the Wilson Observatory. Together, they drew many important figures from the scientific community. Einstein's current visit provided Irene a huge opportunity. A species grasp of general relativity remained the signal to start the domestication process, and time again, the luminary who formulated the theory played a crucial role. The Americans must get there first, I reminded her. I'll see to it, she bristled. Now, what's Jonathan reported about that Turing and von Neumann? It's computers at the crux of it all. Okay, we had Ray's hand come up. Leslie and Becky had hands down. Becky, let's start with you. It was a near thing, though. I'm sorry. Okay. This feels very familiar. I love the title. Um, but, and we've all heard the advice that, like, opening in a tavern is risky. And I was like, ooh, that's a choice. But then flesh consumption, what a marvelous thing. I was like, all right, you're doing something kind of interesting here. I love the voice in that first paragraph. Neat cloak is great. Um, and the kind of... The, the humor here, colleague Irene does a good job. Um, infiltrators needed to, it's a little heavy, but it does, you know, it gets the job done. But I've read a lot of stories about aliens manipulating humanity towards the atom bomb or, you know, driving humanity to become domestication. And I would be looking very quickly for something that makes this stand out from stories that I've read before that do this. Um, because if it's just, if, if it's kind of similar to what I've read before, then, you know, I'm not going to keep reading. The voice is good. You can get, you can get a long way with an interesting voice, but I feel like that faded after that first paragraph. 
when we started to do a lot of heavy world building and that San Gabriel Valley provided our base of operations paragraph, um, there was not a lot of voice in that one. So try to keep that kind of humorous voice to kind of pull the reader through to the point where that interesting twist on this trope appears. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of good here, but I would be looking very quickly for something that makes me go, oh, that's new. You know, that's a new take on this idea. Leslie? Um, I think there's a lot of things that this one does really, really well. Um, I will, like, I, it took me a minute to, to kind of get into the voice, like with that masticated, I just wanted to be like, oh, I don't like that word. Um, but the word fits. The word absolutely fits with the voice that you're creating in this first paragraph. Um, and you do a really good job of feeding the reader bits of information without it feeling heavy handed. It came across very natural. Like you don't have anywhere in the in the like beginning that tells us the time or place. But when it when you put in like the part about Einstein, immediately I'm like, oh, okay, we're in the past. Like you know what I mean? Like you did a very good job of putting that information in a way that felt natural with a very unnatural voice, which I think is is fantastic. Um, like Becky said, I am gonna want to to be like, how is this story different? Like, what is that twist that makes this a take that I've not read a hundred times before? Uh, but I think that what I'm seeing here, the writing itself is, is very strong, which will carry you a long way like the way that you're using voice the way you're putting in information without beating us over the head is done very very well so that goes a long way to keeping a, a reader's attention until you get to the point where you're like haha here's your twist um i mean don't say haha that would be awesome though if writers did that <laughs> a little aside it makes it so um, much clearer when we say aha it would be so much clearer if if writers just said, ha ha, I fooled you, and then revealed. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that there are a lot of really strong things here that will carry this story, hopefully to a point where you're gonna show us that it's something different than what we've seen before. Because if not, Becky and I are both gonna get to the end of it and be like, oh, okay, it's well written but I've read this story before. And unfortunately that is something that happens a lot as a short fiction editor. Like you can read a story and be like, ah, oh, this was a really fantastic haunted house story, but I've read a thousand haunted house stories before and that nothing feels fresh. So just, you need to make sure that the story that you're telling is fresh and that it, it has something to it that the editor's not gonna be like, well, you did, a good job, but it's not different enough for me to pay a pro rate to publish it because our readers could go somewhere else and read pretty much the same story. Um, but I really like the voice. I like the way that you laid out information. I thought that was done very, very well. Like soapbox, that's why it's so important to be reading short fiction in addition to writing it. Because if you don't know what's being done, then you don't know if you're doing the same thing everybody else is doing. And reading current short fiction, like if you're only reading short fiction from the 80s or 90s, you're not going to know what's going on now. And there's so much of it out there. So find it, read it, enjoy it. Ray, what do you think? So I'm going to once again prove that we, what we all know, that this is very subjective. Um, I, I struggled with this voice a lot and the characterization and found it a little inconsistent. I couldn't tell if these aliens or, you know, whoever is sort of imitating us was competent or bumbling. And I think that's sort of a problem for me, like in, in the very opening, um, 
you know, he he's talking about uh, the meat cloak and, you know, this strange style of speaking, using words like masticated, um, which makes me think that initially that they're supposed to be sort of clinical and calculated, but then we have them giving like a friendly wave of silverware. And I can't help but picture that as like bumbling and really obvious and sort of a strange thing to do that would really catch people's attention. And then when I look back at it, we open with at an inconspicuous table. So then it makes me wonder like, well, is this actually sort of a comedy element that these figures think that they're blending in, but they're very obviously not, which I think that angle is really funny and interesting to me. And I'd, I'd really love to read about characters that think they're kind of masterminding something when in all reality, they're very obvious, you know, in, in their approach and they're not getting away with anything. I think that would be really a, a fun story to look at. But I just couldn't tell because like I said, we get this sort of sense of um, maybe a, a clinicality or like an unfeelingness, but then right away, one is apologizing to the other, which is kind of conflicting there. So again, I'm just not sure. Is this supposed to be a comedy or not? Are they supposed to be competent or not? And I think it needs to clearly lean one way or the other. Um, Cause as it is, I just, I can't tell. So I, I don't have a clear picture of, of what the story is trying to achieve. Absolutely. I think that's a good point about tone and about, you know, Becky said earlier, uh, where to hang your hat, like as a reader, and Leslie says repeatedly throughout this process, if we didn't know it was science fiction, how would we know that it's science fiction? Because so far, it's unusual, but we're, I think we're getting there, but we haven't confirmed exactly what genre it is yet. Um, yeah, I'm I think questioning yeah. whether these are aliens or robots. Meat cloak makes me feel like robot, but it could be an alien. Inside processor. Yeah. So. Also, meat but, cloak very much makes me think about they're made out of meat, which is classic. We love we love to see it, but yeah, interesting. A lot of interesting stuff in here, and a very strong voice. I agree. We technically have reached our time, but I do want to pause it that maybe we do one more if Ray and Leslie are well willing. Becky's already said yes. Sure. Yeah. Is that okay? Is that okay? Okay, cool. Uh, we've gotten through quite quite a few today, so I'm very excited about our pace <laughs> on this one because um, it's always so difficult to realize how many we don't get to and how many um, interesting thoughts and ideas and phrases that we, we don't get to talk about and share on the stream. So uh, if we're all good to do one more, we'll do one more and then we'll wrap things up here. This is a short horror story, a horror short story, uh, titled Mr. Major's Puppet. Mr. Major's Puppet was a cheerless, ugly thing. The strings from the wooden crossbars that connected to its head, hands, and feet were hopelessly tangled. Its glass eyes were bulbous and scratched. The smile on its mouth had faded to sneer. The sleeves of its shirt were torn, the hems of its pants ragged. Michael couldn't understand why Mr. Major had it let alone took it with him wherever he went, which in truth wasn't many places, just down to the Flatbush subway entrance where he set up his shoe shining kit and worked six days a week, or over to Harry's for his weekly bottle of vodka. The rest of the time, Mr. Major stayed upstairs in the room he rented from Michael's mother. Every Saturday, while Michael cleaned Mr. Major's room, the man would sit at the table, repairing his shirt, pants, or socks, a glass of vodka close at hand. Mr. Major's bald head would be bent down, his eyes squinting at his sewing, the tufts of gray hair around his ears overgrown and sticking out like a cartoon clown's. Michael hated the way the room smelled, the heavy odor of perspiration and shoe polish. And then there was the puppet, sitting upright on the shelf. The first time Michael had seen it, he had been excited, imagining Mr. Major a puppeteer, eager to entertain. But when Michael asked him for a puppet show, Mr. Major had said, his voice clipped, it's not that kind of puppet. Okay, last submission. No hands in the air. Everyone is tense. Ray, what do you think? I love that last line. That's a killer last, last line. It's not that kind of puppet. Um, 
I thought this was great. Um, I I like the descriptions of the puppet. I I think they could be smoothed out a little bit, maybe vary the the sentence structure a little bit in that opening because it did feel like a lot of similar sentences one after another. Um, but in general, I'm sort of a sucker for like a haunted doll or a haunted puppet. Um, and I kind of think that's where we're probably going here. Um, so I would keep reading. The other note that I had was Michael sort of came as a surprise to me um, in the second paragraph. I was all like, oh, there's Michael. Who's Michael? Um, you know, uh, so just something to maybe think about um, as the author polishes it, um, that sort of intro of who our narrator is, if there's a way to make that a little smoother because right now it felt to me like he kind of popped his head in to like Mr. Mazur's story. Um, but yeah, I, I really thought this was fun and I hope that the puppet is haunted or possessed or something. Love that for us. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Becky, what do you think? I am all in on this. I think this is delightful. Um, it, it I think it's a good place to end because it highlights a lot of the things that we've said. I'm grounded in the setting. They run a boarding house. The kid helps his mom run it. He's kind of freaked out by this old guy and his puppet. Um, I, I kind of, I all of the physical descriptions are linked to an emotional reaction. Like it smells bad because it smells like perspiration and shul polish. It, Michael couldn't understand why Mr. Major had it. And if it just ended there, I would have been like, why not? let alone took it everywhere with him. I'm like, oh, well, that's weird. In truth, which wasn't many places, which does world building and continues to grow this kind of like strange atmosphere around these characters. So I would like the writer to send this to me so that I can find out what kind of puppet it is because I really want to know. Um, and I am all in on this story. I think it's great. The, this opening is is really exciting to me. Totally. Leslie, what do you think? Um, one of the things that first occurred to me, and it wasn't even a conscious occurrence, is that, like, I'm reading it, and, and you can, t I felt like you could tell, like, Michael, it's, it's like a child's perspective, because um, I felt like the details you're giving are definitely things that kids would notice, Um so I think that is really good like when it says Michael couldn't understand why I don't know why but immediately I'm going Michael's a kid <laughs> like because Michael doesn't understand why adults would do what adults do um so I really really enjoyed that I thought that there were a lot of really clear descriptions I think you're slowly building attention um because you know it it's not that kind of puppet. Like we're slowly getting tension without it being like in our face and like shocking, which I think is really nice. Like I kind of like a slow build horror that um, it, it doesn't shove it all right in your face right at the beginning. And I think that this does a really good job of that. And I like the perspective coming from a child who, um, is kind of watching this weird thing kind of maybe happen. Um, so I would be very interested to see where it goes from here. Super strong opening. I'm I'm also, I'm, I'm like Rubik's cubing this in my mind based on the feedback that we've had today, just for curiosity's sake, like what if it starts with Michael doesn't understand why Mr. Major has the puppet, but that's not as interesting as the puppet is really hideous and here are all of the things you need to know about it. And then it gets weirder by us saying that he takes it every, so like, I'm like flipping things around and going, no, I feel like this is, I feel like this is a strong opening. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I think I speak for all of us when I say, what kind of puppet is it? <laughs> what other kinds of puppets are there? And why? <laughs> um, thank you all for indulging me on an encore. <laughs> I just thought it would be a really fun one to end with. And, um, you know, the random order of the stories is always a surprise to us. So thank you to all of the authors who submitted pieces for feedback um, today. Please know how much we appreciate each and every one of you, even if we didn't get to your words. And if we did get to your words, I hope very much that our conversation was helpful to you in some way. 
Uh, I know that uh, every time we do this, I learn new things about the craft and about uh, different opinions. And like like Ray has has emphasized, and we've all emphasized today, ev editors are human. Editors have opinions and and uh, biases that they know about. And um, so so there's I don't think there's any one mathematical true way to get through the slush pile, right? But hopefully this this process helps you realize that you're not alone. In, in that process in learning to develop your own craft along the way. I hope all the comments today were helpful and that you were able to learn something new. I certainly did. Um, thank you to our judges, Becky, Leslie, and Ray. Ray, especially being our guest, thank you so much for being here. It was awesome to have your input. Uh, I hope we get to do this again with you um, sometime in the future. Uh, and if you all enjoyed what you saw and heard here today, you can visit us online at apex-magazine.com and follow us on Twitter at Apex Mag because I'm not calling it X. I'm not going to call it X. It's 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 Twitter, okay? I'm not I'm not there yet. I'm not ready to let go. You can also support Apex by becoming a backer on Patreon or just subscribing via the website or waitlist books. Thank you to everyone in the YouTube chat as well. We're so happy that you tuned into the stream, and uh, we we hope that this will prove to be a fun experience for you to return to uh, throughout. Uh, the quarters as we head into our next quarter for the next snap judgment. I'm your host and narrator, Allie Grauer. I hope to see you all again at the next one. And thank you so much for being here. We love to see it. We're glad that you're a part of this process for us. And 